Good morning. We're getting ready to start. We got about five more minutes, but I thought I'd give you a, give you a view of what's going on right now. And the fellowship hall at the uh, Owego United Methodist Church. <laughs> you guys are being broadcast worldwide right now. <laughs> Straighten your ties. You know. Yeah, Facebook. Yeah, really is. I I, uh, I don't know that I don't know how many people from around the world outside of the United States are actually watching. I'm just saying it's being broadcast. <laughs> that works about so good. Uh -huh. It really does. <laughs> well, I mean the. <laughs> okay. That's here. You're we'll, we'll be with you bit after. There. A bit. Do you want to? Too bad we couldn't have this show in there. But hey, Eleanor, are you ready to go? It will when he moves. And I bought a couple of hot match holders. Oh, no, no. I've been thinking about it for a few weeks and haven't gotten Yeah. I might. Yeah. You can keep talking, it's okay. <laughs> we, got a, we got a couple minutes yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've actually tried that. It does, it does not work? Yeah, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't work well anyway. Way. Not fishing line. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well be at this point. <laughs> David is, is so incredibly helpful and, and so dependable, and uh, but he will not unwind my cords. <laughs> there, it's, the, it's a union thing. It's a <laughs> Shameless plug. 
Well, good morning. Good morning. It is a joy to welcome you to worship here in the Fellowship Hall of the Owego United Methodist Church. Whether you're here in the Fellowship Hall of the Owego United Methodist Church or whether you are elsewhere, uh, you are welcome and, uh, and we're glad to be here together today. As we prepare to enter into a time of worship, I do want to make a couple of announcements. Um, we uh, just recently learned that John Zuckman has died. And uh, he had had a stroke, which was rather massive. And uh, just this week, he did die on, uh, uh, well, actually, it was, wow, Monday, August 31st. We just heard the tail end of this week, really. So um, prayers for his family, certainly. Uh, we were able to have the service in the sanctuary yesterday for Bev Arby's. I think that we will continue to be able to do that. Um, it worked It worked pretty well. Uh, we had to take out the uh, pew pads, and, uh, and as worn as the pew pads may be, they were still much prettier than the, <laughs> than the bare wood. On the other hand, if you have to stand the whole time, uh, it's, it's far more uh, straining, I'm sure. But um, do appreciate, uh, BJ came in and, and got all of those out. Um, it, uh, it, that's just one of the things that we are supposed to do for COVID and we are trying to comply in every way to make sure that we are protecting the people who are here and also that uh, we are providing the opportunity for folks to uh, come and, and worship and to feel uh, that their church is still their church. And that's a fine line sometimes. But I uh, sure appreciate everybody who works so diligently to make sure that that happens. Um, just as, as some prayer concerns, I certainly want to lift up the fires out. In, well, I'd like to put them down, actually. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, the fires that are raging in the, uh, in the West, um, some of which at least have been intentionally set, uh, and uh, which leads us to the second concern, which you know, the, uh, the anger that is welling up and the anarchy that seems to be so profoundly at work um, as a result of it. I think a lot of it really, really uh, revolves around anger. So the riots that are, we're experiencing in Rochester, and, and I understand that the, uh, the demonstrations last, uh, yesterday, I believe they were, in Binghamton? Yes. Uh, my understanding is that they were peaceful, a lot of yelling and stuff, but it, they were peaceful and there was nothing destroyed. And, uh, and so uh, we're thankful for that, for sure. Um, so there are others. Do you have any other prayer concerns that you'd like to lift up? All right. Seeing none, then I would uh, invite you to engage in worship with us. And uh, I will invite you to come forward and uh, lead us. I never thought I would be introducing myself as the masked liturgist, <laughs> also known as Bob. And good morning. It is certainly a joy to be here to worship here at the Owego United Methodist Church on one of the final Sundays of summer. We um, have dealt with a very difficult summer, very challenging, and yet um, despite the um, problems that we as a community, as a nation, as a world have been dealing with for the last six months. We are looking forward with excitement and a little trepidation, but we know God is going to be with us in the coming weeks and months. Now, oh, I will. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm not used to working from a script. <laughs> As we begin our service this morning, please join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be in the attitude of prayer. O oh God, we are so thankful to be able to gather together today, even during these tough times, and in fact, especially during these tough times. And we lift up everybody who is with us in our fellowship hall on Main Street in the village of Owego on this Sunday morning. We lift up those who may be joining us as we stream this service live, or perhaps people who watch the service later via uh, the internet. We know so many people would like to join together. It is so difficult for us to be here today and not be able to shake hands or embrace each other or do the things that we typically are able to do in our church. We pray for those who are dealing with losses, those who have lost loved ones through various illnesses, whether it's COVID-19 or so many other things, we pray for those who are hospitalized this morning and also for those who are dealing with some of life's tough challenges, psychological challenges at this time. We lift up everybody because we all need to support each other and we know, God, that you will help us get through this. We pray for our pastor, Jamie, and his wife, Kathy, and their family. We pray for all of our first responders in our community and across the country. Please watch over them during these especially difficult times. And as Jamie mentioned, we are facing a time of divisiveness. We, in the next several weeks, will probably go through a lot. And we ask, oh God, that you help to unite us we are the United States of America, and ultimately, I believe we all want the best for our country, and we all want the best for each other. So God, please, during this troubling time, bring us together. We ask all this through your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now Jamie will present a children's time message. Well, I, I thought that it might be good, since we are so rapidly approaching Christmas, to, uh, to talk about, uh, about Christmas a little bit in light of the, uh, the subject of the sermon this morning, which is, what people? Did you, did you, uh, 490, did you not, do you not understand that? Well, we're talking about forgiveness. Anybody seven. clicking now? Yeah, seven times seven. Seven, actually, 70 times 7. Yes, it's 490. So we're going to talk about forgiveness. And, and um, I thought about various places where forgiveness was necessary in my life. And, and trying to think back to the time when I was the age of some of the children who hopefully are listening this morning. And perhaps some of the adults will have enough memory left to go back to that time with me. But uh, I had two sisters, 
And uh, my older sister and I, and, and this is mostly on her, I'm sure, but it might have been a little on me too. Robbie, if you're watching, it was all me. Okay. So anyway, um, it, was, uh, it, it was one of those things that happened at Christmas time. And if you did something that the other one didn't like, there was an immediate threat. And the threat was, I'm not going to get you a Christmas present. <laughs> Um, you know, that never actually happened. We always got each other Christmas presents. And uh, we, uh, but you had to, you know, you had to forgive one another because you had to because you really wanted to get a Christmas present, right? And, uh, and so uh, we, we learned some lessons in forgiveness, which to this day still exist. Because uh, my, uh, my older sister and my younger sister both buy me wonderful Christmas presents. Now, one of the wonderful Christmas presents that my older sister bought me was this tie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now you guys can't see it, but if you could see it, it is a guitar. This is a guitar tie or a, gu a guitar, if you will. Now, in Australia, you don't talk about the guitars because it just sounds like you're greeting people. Guitar, right? Okay. Anyway, uh, so my sister still gives me good presents. She doesn't threaten that she's not going to give me a Christmas present. and I don't threaten her that I'm not going to give her a Christmas present. In fact, I have hers already. Anyway, uh, so... You know, but one of the things that, that God tells us is that we have to forgive one another too. In fact, it is really, really important to forgive each other. And, uh, and I think sometimes when we're growing up, uh, the place where we have the most activity in terms of forgiving each other is with our brothers and sisters. Because nobody can get on your nerves like a brother or sister when you're young. It all disappears by the time you get older, but when you're young, it's tough. So some of you guys who have brothers and sisters know what I'm talking about. And, and uh, you know, we, we know we have to forgive each other. But God says you have to forgive as well. And God emphasizes it really, really strongly. And, uh, and what God says is, you know, if you really want me to forgive you, then you're going to have to forgive other people. We said that in the Apostles' Creed. It's going to come out again in the scripture for today. God says you have to do this. And one of the reasons why, I think, at least from my own experiences, is that we have to forgive because if we don't forgive, we can't understand and really live in the forgiveness that God gives us. And that's super important. So you may want to listen to the sermon because it'll make sense to you, I think, regardless of how old you are. And, uh, and so, kids, if you want to listen in, carefully do that because I think there may be some things that will be helpful to you in, in the adult part of the service as well. Will you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, we thank you. for the forgiveness you offer us. For the forgiveness you offer us. We receive it, we receive it. With, joy. with joy. And we pray, and we pray you, would help us you would help us to forgive others. To forgive others. This, brings you joy, this brings you joy and brings us peace and, brings us peace and, multiplies, and multiplies the forgiveness you give us. The forgiveness you give us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right, I'll invent, invent. <laughs> I will invite Bob to come forward again and lead us in the scripture. Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and besought him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord announced him and said, or summoned him and said to him, you wicked servants, I forgave you all that debt because you besought me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Whenever I get to a passage on forgiveness, you're going to hear me preach on it. Um, it is a, uh, I'm going to turn a little bit so I'm facing other people. I, I like looking at Jeff. You know, <laughs> Bev is even more pleasant to look at. But, you know, anyway, um, forgiveness, I think, is the biggest issue in Christianity today. I really do. I think there is nothing in our life experience which is so apt to destroy the journey toward Christian perfection to which we are called, and which we acclaim as, as Methodists in particular. Now, when I'm talking about Christian perfection, I'm talking about being perfected in love, in the love of God, and in the way that that works itself out in the world. And so when we get to this passage, um, you know, clearly it is on forgiveness, and, and we recognize some things, and, and it's a little bit scary. When I read this passage, um, it it. It gets inside me and sticks out stickers and says, wait a minute, hold it, you know, um, you know, and, uh, and I, have to, I have to rethink some things in my own life because forgiveness is one of the hardest things that we have to do in life. And it is imperative and it becomes very clear that it's imperative in this question. Now it starts out innocently enough, uh, only... It also reflects human nature and, and our sin and our capacities. And so Peter goes to Jesus, and, uh, and Peter approaches Jesus, and he says, you know, how, how often should I forgive my brother? And essentially the implication is for the same thing. How many times should I forgive my brother for sinning against me and doing the same thing over and over again. In point of fact, let me give you an example, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and, he, and so he goes to Jesus and he says this. And, and, but he wants to look good. He wants Jesus to know that he understands about forgiveness. And so he, he chooses the number seven. Now, biblically, and the Jews played games with numbers. They had, they had, and I've talked to you about this before, they had... Numbers for everything. Well, seven is the number of God. Uh, six is the number of man when we're recreated on the sixth day. So six has always been the number of man. Isn't it interesting 
that the Antichrist number is? Yeah. That's the one we usually hear. Actually, there's some discrepancy in the old texts. And uh, like 636 is, uh, is one other option and 666. But 6 is the number of man. 7 is the number of God. So, you know, Peter is trying to look as godly here as he possibly can. He wants to impress Jesus with the fact that he understands. And what is Jesus' response to it? <sighs> nice try, Peter. <laughs> but in point of fact, it's 70 times 7. Now, again, older manuscripts, sometimes, you, you know, it's like the interpretation is a little difficult for us. This is the, this is the one that I, I personally feel uh, is probably exactly what Jesus was saying. Because 75, 70 times 7 is, an, is a, uh, a reference to infinity for the Jews. Okay, so in other words, it's not 490 even, which most of us, how many people here have forgiven somebody for the same sin over and over again, 490 times? Oh, so, yeah. You may not be getting into heaven today. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because it's probably been more like 700. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big number, and, and probably we wouldn't even consider that and yet what Jesus is really saying is not 490 but as many times as you are required to do it by not not as you are required to do it by how you feel but as you are required to do it by how they sin that doesn't rock your world a little bit nothing will and then Jesus goes on and tells a parable of the kingdom of heaven that ought to set everybody's liver a quiver okay <laughs> Because it's serious stuff. And what does he do? He, he is likening. So, okay, so who is, who is the, uh, the master? God. Okay. Who is the servant? The first servant. The one that owes, what was it, 10,000? 10,000 talents. Talents? Yeah. yeah, which is more than a denarii, by the way. <laughs> uh, let's see. A denarii was a day's pay at the time. Okay. How does, how does a servant come up with owing that much? You're a gambling problem. <laughs> well, but, but he, he borrowed it from the master. Isn't that fascinating? Again, doesn't that add something to this equation? Obviously, the servant has a relationship with the master. Whether he acknowledges that or not, the servant has a relationship with the master. And who is this first servant in the story? Who is it a reference to for you and me? It's me. Or it's you. Yeah. And don't even put it in us. Because that cuts you more slack than you really are warranted. Okay? And I'm serious. You think about that. That servant is me. That servant is you. And then there's another extraneous servant that comes in who owes the first servant, you or me, money. Now, these are slaves, but apparently they have money. They borrow from one another. It is not warranted on the part of the master to give them anything or to allow them to do anything, all right, to make money for themselves. And yet there is this exchange that goes on between them. And that tells us something about God, doesn't it? God gives us something, and he gives us something, and he gives us something more. Now, it isn't always money, okay? This is just an example that in our human condition really hits us, right? Yeah, we understand money. We don't really, but we do, okay? And so the first servant is called to account, and his account, which has come due, is um, when he began the reckoning, that is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the king, he, uh, uh, there was one brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, and he could not pay. If you owe 10,000 talents, what are the chances you're going to be able to pay? If you owe $10,000 right now, and someone demanded it of you, Right now, how many of you 
Don't raise your hands if you do, because then we'll all be jealous. Okay. <laughs> How many of you could could uh, muster up that ten grand and pay them off? Now again, remember, this is ten thousand talents, which is far more than ten thousand denarii, which is a day's pay. Even if it were ten thousand denarii. Uh, what's an average day's pay today? You know, um, okay, let's say 100 bucks a day, just to make it easy. Okay, 100 bucks a day times 10,000 would be 100,000, right? 100 times 10, where would it be a million? Okay, it'd be a million, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I should have done that on paper before. I, you know. <laughs> Uh, I can do that on paper. I don't have to have a computer. But, okay, so he owed the king, owed the master, owed his owner a million bucks. How in the world did he get that far in debt? How do we get in debt as far as we get? You know. And so he, uh, he begs, he pleads, he owes the master his very life He's already a slave. So, you know, basically he's going to be thrown into prison with his wife and his children until he can pay. What are the chances he's ever going to pay <laughs> if he's in prison? You know, zippity doo da. And now we get another inkling into the character and the nature of the master, of the king, of God, which is as he begs and pleads for mercy, his master says, all right, I forgive you the debt. Now, think about that. That is not, I'll give you another year to pay me off. That is, the debt is gone. And so he goes off on his merry way, having essentially just made a million dollars in about two minutes. Um, the, uh, uh, the most money I ever made an hour I figured was about uh, $300 an hour. And I got a call from a, a funeral director asking me if I could do a funeral on a given day. I said, yes. I said, who do I contact? And he said, well, you can't. They're flying in from Texas, and uh, they're, we're going to do the service here, and then they're, they're going to be leaving again and, uh, uh, and flying back to Texas on the next flight out. And you can't contact anybody between now and then. And I said, well, what will I say about the person? How will I know? And, and he said, nobody wants any of that. They just want some scripture and prayer and, and away you go. You know? And so I said, okay, so there's really nothing I can do to prepare for this then. And he goes, no, no, not really. Just be here. You know, bring your book. So I went. And uh, I got there, and as I was walking up the steps, a, uh, a, uh, a cab pulled in from the airport, dropped off everybody in the family. They all went inside, never said a word to me. I didn't shake my hand, just walked right past me and went in and sat down and uh, uh, whispered something to the, uh, um, the funeral director, which I found out later was, Make, make sure this is short, because the cabbie is waiting. So I went in, I read some scripture, I said some prayers, and I left and walked back home. And as they were, uh, as they were leaving, they handed me an envelope. And in the envelope was 100 bucks, which was a lot of money in that, at that point in time in our lives. And, and it was dirty money. I mean, it felt creepy beyond words. It had taken me 20 minutes from the time I got up from my desk, walked to the funeral home, did the service, walked back to my desk. It had taken me exactly 20 minutes. I made $300 an hour that day. You know, what's the most you ever made in a day? You know, we, we, by the way, we, we called a babysitter. I went home and said to Kathy, where do you want to go eat? What movie do you want to go see? And we ate really nicely that night, went to a movie, and the babysitter got the rest, which was about three times as much as she normally would have gotten because we did not want any of that money in our hands that night. 
Uh, it was it was creepy beyond words. I can't even tell you. But that was a lot. What's the most you ever made in an hour? This guy made a million dollars, let's say. Only it was, again, that would have been if it was 10,000 denarii. Okay, but it was 10,000 talents, which is more than a denarii. So realistically, I mean, I don't know what the exchange rate was then, but realistically, it probably was more like 10 million. You know? And he was forgiven all of it in one fell swoop. And on his way out of the room, encountered someone else who no doubt was coming to an account for the king because the king was calling everybody to account. The master was calling all of his servants, his slaves, to account. God is calling us all to account. And as he left the place, this guy probably was standing in line waiting to go see the king, the master, God. And he grabs him by the throat and which basically, if somebody grabs you by the throat and starts choking you down and telling you that you've got to do something for them, um, that's, that's a threat on your life. Okay, and that's what he was doing. He said, I want my money and I want it now. And obviously, the power of the king over him um, was, was in his mind, had nothing to do with mercy and grace and love. It had to do with power. And he missed, he missed the mercy, and he missed the grace, and he grabbed the power, and he demanded a payback from this servant after having been just released from a debt which made this look like nothing. And Jesus uses this parable because we all understand it. We want what's ours. And if we had taken advantage of, we're not going to like that very much, are we? Anybody here ever been taken advantage of? <laughs> How many of you enjoyed that experience? How many of you rejoiced in this newfound opportunity to forgive? Yeah, it's not where we go with that stuff. But you know what? If you are in Christ, that is where you need really to go. I've known one person in my life who was good at that. I've known one person in my life who was really, really good at that, and I've seen it happen to him again and again and again. And, uh, and he always recovers from it wonderfully. And uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing thing. You know my blue guitar? I've got my blue guitar because of that very thing. A uh, guy came, needed to borrow some money. He lent it to him, and the guy left his guitar as collateral. And he said, don't, I don't, I don't play. Go keep it. I don't care. Just, just, you know, when you get it, pay me back. And, uh, and he never returned. And what my friend didn't know is that he'd gone off and used the money to uh, purchase some drugs and wound up killing himself. So, um, you know, of all the things, uh, and then, then it's, it was an expensive guitar worth more than the collateral that he put into it. And, and what happened to that guitar? Well, it became the redemption guitar. And, and you've probably heard that story if I haven't told you before, um, because I use that guitar for church stuff. And, uh, uh, and I do that on purpose. You know, and and uh, and so it was a gift to me from this guy. So he's still out the money. Does he care? No. You know what? He loves the he loves the story of the redemption guitar. Folks, we are we are demanded. This is not a request on God's part. This is not a suggestion on God's part. This is a demand, a command, an absolute. And and he says, you have to learn to forgive. And if you are going to experience my forgiveness, says God, you're going to have to learn to forgive. Because you will not experience anything like the fullness of it. You may not experience any of it. You may just breathe a sigh because 
you think your debt is paid and then you go on about your business and do the kind of things that you do that I do or that I think about doing. And, uh, and we sit in judgment on those who owe us. And we forget how much God has offered to write off our accounts. And, and so this, again, this is a demand. This is a command. This is not a suggestion on God's part. In point of fact, it is such an imperative that he says, you know, beware of hell. You do realize that's, that's what that part's about, right? <laughs> you know? Um, he's saying beware because if you do not experience the fullness of my forgiveness, you have no place with me. And that's, whose choice is that? Ours. It's ours, yeah. God loves us enough to forgive any debt that we owe him. Any and every debt that we owe Fully, completely, and absolutely. Forgiven, gone, removed, does not exist anymore. But he calls on us to learn from our own forgiveness how to forgive others. What would happen in your life? Now just stop for a second, okay? Someone who owes you something, an apology, money, a life, Somebody who owes you something that instantly comes into your mind when I say that. And I doubt there's a single person here who couldn't come up with a name. Do not say them out loud, okay? But as you look at that person, what would change in your life if you actually forgave them? For their sin, for their actions, for their lack of actions, for words spoken for things done, for messing up your life. And there isn't a single person here who hasn't had their life messed up by somebody at some point in time or other. And you know what? God says, praise me for that opportunity because if you can forgive them, you're going to understand my forgiveness a whole lot better, a whole lot more. And it is going to change who you are in the depth of your heart. And it is, going to, it is going to tie you in with the master. Not because you owe him. You know, have you ever been tied to somebody because you owed him something? Somebody you really would rather not have been had any association with, but somehow you owed them something and you were tied to them? Well, how about being tied to somebody who you owe nothing and who gives you everything? And, and so what is it that is required of us? Forgiveness. And, uh, and forgiveness is tough. And God understands that. God understands that because he also sees the consequences of unforgiveness. And you know what? They're tougher. They are tougher. And your unforgiveness feeds back on you far more than it does on the person that you haven't forgiven, who perhaps never even knows. And even if they do, they can't tie into it fully. It is a difficult, difficult thing to do to forgive. Some forgiveness is easy, you know. Oh, man, I forgot. Well, you know, that really messed my life up. I'm so sorry. Okay, well, you know, don't ever let it happen again. Until the next time. Uh, 70 times 7. <laughs> that was a personal shot right there. Okay. But we're called to forgiveness. Forgiveness is the thing that makes us, now get this, forgiveness is the thing that makes us truly human. Not human as we know humanity today, but human as God knew humanity in, in Eden. Without the burdens, without the pain, without the feelings of responsibility, you know one reason why it eats you up so much if you haven't forgiven somebody? It's because you know the difference, because you've been forgiven. And God is eating at that and saying, you know, today it's time to forgive this. 
Now, yesterday's forgiveness may not be enough for today. Um, that's one of the things that's hard for us when it comes to forgiveness because we think, uh, okay, I'm done with that. Until the next time it kind of pops up. And, and the best thing I can tell you about that is sort of, it's sort of like layers of an onion. You peel a layer off and it looks just exactly the same, but what you can't see is it's a little bit smaller. And the, and the largest part of it has been eaten away by your forgiveness. And so you keep peeling layers. And you know what? Tomorrow you may have to peel another layer. Yesterday's forgiveness may not be enough for today. And today's forgiveness may not be enough for tomorrow. But you know what? That's fine. That's perfect. Because it reminds us of the continued element of God's forgiveness in our life. And don't ever miss that. And of course, you always, if you're going to talk about forgiveness, you always have to talk about forgiving yourself because that's the hardest of all. Because, you know, my sins are ever before me, as the, uh, as the, uh, the psalmist says. And, uh, and the reality is, of course, yeah. But here's the other side of that deal. You have to forgive yourself, too. It isn't just about forgiving others. It would be great if we did that well. Most of us don't. We have to constantly be reminded. But if God has forgiven you, who are you to hold that against yourself? And I do not mean this casually, so it's like, oh, I'm all good now. Yeah, I'm sorry I did that to you, but, you know, it's okay now because God's forgiven me. I'm not, not that glib garbage, okay? I'm talking about the real depth of it. Now, when you have received God's forgiveness and you begin to receive forgiveness from yourself, it turns things around... And, uh, and, you know, it isn't just a matter of being sorry, but you may even find ways to uh, do some things that are redemptive. If you can start forgiving yourself, it turns you around, because if you start doing redemptive things without forgiving yourself, you're going to feel like the biggest hypocrite that the world has ever known. Anybody ever feel that way? Yes, am Yes, sir. But you know, uh, one of the success stories in our society is a group called AA. And it brings me to that because I have a couple good friends, one who died uh, not too long ago, and, uh, and his wife, uh, who were uh, severe alcoholics before they became adults. And... Uh, and who spent a lot of time in sobriety over the, in the years that I knew them, they, they were uh, in sobriety the whole time. But um, one of the things that AA does is it, you know, it says, okay, guess what? I got a problem. I, I know I have a problem. I know I can't control it, but I know I have to give it to God <laughs> who can. And from there, there's all kinds of extra stuff that comes in to take you down that journey so that you let go and let God, and that's such a trite statement. Oh my gosh, what a powerful one it is. And, uh, and things change up. And things change up for us. So, um, you know, God can do that in us, which we cannot do in ourselves, but you're going to have to forgive yourself. Guess what? You know, it's, it's like you are, you are the same servant who just got forgiven, you know, $10 million, and you're going back to yourself and you're beating yourself up because of something else. You know, God has forgiven you. Do not think that you are more godly than God, and that's why you can't forgive yourself. There's where the trouble starts in self-forgiveness. Because it's like, well, you know, God is righteous, but, but I just can't forgive myself. And, uh, and if, if you're saying that, what you're saying is God is righteous, but I'm more righteous and my evil is before me and, and uh, I know how bad it is and God really doesn't even understand. That's a level of idolatry you don't want to get into. And, and yet, every single one of us has done that very thing, I suspect. <sighs> Forgiveness. I, you know, it, again, it is the thing which stands most firmly and planted in the pathway of our salvation. And it is the thing which God says, this will destroy your relationship with me. And I do not want that because I want you forgiven. 
I don't want you living in unforgiveness because you can't understand what it even means to be forgiven unless you forgive. And there are things that, folks, you cannot forgive. Okay, that's the dichotomy. There are things that you absolutely cannot forgive. And what, I, what I'm telling you is God can. And God can work that forgiveness in you. I'll finish off with a, a story, which I've told before. Most of you have heard this story, and I'll keep on telling this story. Sorry, at Mitch. Didn't realize it was a microphone. <laughs> and, and I'll keep on telling this story because the person of whom this story is uh, their life gave me permission to do this. Okay? Uh, had a couple come in for counseling. Um, a lot of what was going on in their relationship went back to her relationship with her stepfather, who was physically abusive. She left the family one morning in November when she woke up on the front lawn with her hair frozen to the ground in a pool of her own blood. Okay. Seriously. Uh, she moved in with neighbors who had been aware. Nowadays, somebody would have gone to prison. You know, In those days, not so much. You didn't interfere with family politics, right? And so uh, she grew up that way and, uh, and had built a little fortress around herself and nobody was coming inside that. And as we talked, I said, um, there is an answer to beginning the journey. And that answer is you need to, you need to uh, forgive your stepfather. Blow up, got up and left. Called back about two weeks later, came back in. We talked about it. I said, you know, one of the things you got to understand is forgiveness is not saying that what they did is all right, because in fact, it's saying quite the opposite. If you have to forgive, then it says they did something wrong. We talked about it a little bit. She got angry again and left, which was, you know, I mean, I understood that this is, this is tough to hear, that you, the victim, have to forgive. What would happen if all the victims in the world today forgave? Think it would change things up much? Okay, so we went through this about six times in which she got up and left furious. And finally, we were together one night and, uh, and I said, do you want to forgive him? And she said, no. And I said, do you want to want to forgive him? No, you're all, some of you guys are going, I've heard this before. <laughs> Do you want to want to want to forgive him? No. Do you want to want to want to want to forgive him? No. Do you want to want to want to want to forgive him? Yes. Precisely. Incisively. <laughs> right down to the middle. And I said, good. Good. I said, if you can actually say that, then that's not you. That's God in you working. And, uh, and you're going to have success in this. And I said, uh, what I would like for you to do is I'd like for you to write a letter to your stepfather. Don't send it. Look it over. Think about it. And then, uh, then throw it away and write another one. And when you find one that you think you can send that says what you feel, then bring it in and we'll go over it. And we'll decide whether we're going to send it or not. And so she did. It was the second letter she wrote. And I read it and I said, this is good stuff. And it was a letter saying, I've chosen to forgive you because I will no longer allow you to run my life. Okay? And, uh, and it went into some concepts of forgiveness, which I wasn't sure whether she'd heard or not, you know. And she had. And she wrote those things down. And she sent it out. She sent it out on a Monday. She got a call Tuesday night. It was the man in question. He was in tears. He, uh, he, was, he thanked her for the letter. He said, you have no idea how many times I've called every number in your phone number except the last one. Uh, he said, I accepted Christ a few years ago, and I've lived in misery ever since because of what I did to you. And, uh, and so they had a great conversation. And she was able to forgive him verbally, not just written, and the next day he died of a massive coronary. Yeah.
What has someone done to you that you haven't been able to let go of? What's it going to take? Because this is how important it is. This is how important it is to God. This is how important it is to you. So what I'm going to tell you finally is this. Spend time praying about forgiveness. Ask the Lord to bring to your mind, sit there with a pen and a piece of paper or a pencil. It would be great if a pencil because then you can erase them as you go through. <laughs> and, and write down the people that God brings to mind in the situations. And choose, because forgiveness is a choice. Choose to forgive. And then God will help you actualize what you have chosen and make it real in you and work the forgiveness in you because God is the one who works forgiveness. But we have to choose to let him. That's where the difference is. That's where this story comes out of. You know? And you've got to choose right now. It's 70 times 7, which is infinity. That doesn't mean you have to submit yourself to situations where you're going to get used by the same person in the same way over and over again. All that does is enhance their sin. However, just make that choice. It is your choice to make. And, and, and the reality is you are going to give up your life to do that. It'll cost you your life. But what it's going to give you is your life. You remember I was talking about, uh, you know, to be truly human. And, uh, and that is the reality. If you want to be truly human, that is the uh, reality of Eden, not of the present time. You're going to have to forgive. Because we were not designed to hang on to all of this crap in our life. So I say to you, get out your stuff, because <laughs> we're going we're gonna to be doing communion. So if you have your, uh, your juice and your bread, break it out, please. <clears throat> and I will say to you, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, and it is a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give our thanks and praise to our God and King, who has forgiven his servants the massive debt which we all incur to him. And he has forgiven that debt and he has given us new life. And in that new life, we join their unending hymn and we say together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and sacred is your name. You have sent your Son so that we could experience that forgiveness. You have paid the debt through his life, through his blood, the sacrifice of himself. Your sacrifice, which is sufficient to pay every debt that we have incurred to you and every debt that anyone else has ever Occur, it incurred to you and any debt that anyone has incurred to us, the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient to pay that debt. And so we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. So Lord, we come to this, your table. It is your table. And yet it has been set for us. We remember that on that night, the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. 
And after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The remembrance of Christ is a remembrance of forgiveness, and it is a call to forgiveness. And so as we celebrate this meal, we recognize the presence of Christ in it. The symbols of the juice and the symbols of the bread which we have and hold together. We lift them up now before the Lord. Bread representing the body of Christ. The juice representing the blood of Christ. Christ's present with us in this meal and his presence with us as we go from it. Father, make this be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Fill us, strengthen us, encourage us, and renew us, and Lord, work forgiveness in us, and work forgiveness through us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Body of Christ, given for you. And the blood of Christ, shed for you. Now, take of these elements, receive them in joy, and praise God in them. Body of Christ, God for you, and the blood of Christ, shed for you. Body of Christ, God Will you pray with me? Lord, we have received your gracious gift, this symbol of forgiveness, your forgiveness for us. And now, strengthened by this spiritual food, work that forgiveness through us and into the lives of others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, again, we will be doing communion every Sunday. Um, for the foreseeable future. So keep keep it up. Um, and, and David, the Diet Coke is not. <laughs> not. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. even, even, even Cherry Coke. Even Cherry Coke is not, uh, yeah, just, just saying. <laughs> well, you receive the benediction and the prayer of dedication. Let's pray together. Lord, the gifts which we bring to you now, we ask to be used for your glory and in your kingdom. And uh, we ask it in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, in the name of that same Lord, Jesus Christ, who has worked forgiveness in you, may you walk as an example of forgiveness and of love. Amen. Amen. And you are dismissed. <laughs> <clears throat>
Thank you. Good. Thank you.